928-8822 or visit heartdrop.com. Extend your life with Extend the opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. Stumbling down the road with Bridget Lynn Dolgoff as she carries stones, digs holes, and wheels her shovels on her way. This road is the real path. It is never easy and never clear, but always entertaining. This journey has not been a seated event as Bridget walks, runs, stumbles, carries, digs, drags, laughs, fights, sings, prays, dances, kicks, screams, and oftentimes falls. Hey everybody, this is your host, Bridget Lynn Dolgoff of the Wednesday edition of Caring Stones and Digging Holes radio show here on Revolution Radio. Um, you can go to Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, and you can look at our funding area, uh, everything we do. We are 100% listener supported. Um, everybody that is involved with Revolution Radio volunteers their time to either host produce, um, you know, keep our network going. So uh, you can find multiple ways. I do some, ad I pay for archives and I also um, pay for advertising for my alternative medicine online healthcare business. Um, but you could, you know, buy heirloom seeds, you could do all kinds of stuff, um, even just, you know, flip a couple tens our way, you know, periodically. That would be great too. Um, also, you can go to Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, go to the schedule. Uh, my shows are always in Studio A. And uh, you can find me at this time, which is noon Eastern Standard Time to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time uh, on the Studio A schedule list. Uh, you'll see a bee with pollen on its legs flying towards a flower. Same thing for Saturday um, at... Uh, Saturdays at um, trying to remember the 10 a or my time is 10 a.m. It's 1 p.m. Uh, p.m. Eastern Standard Time to um, noon Eastern Standard Time, and also it has the be with the flower. Also, if you click on those, you can go to a back page and it has some links and information about the show, and it has contact information. So um, anyway, I have a guest um, today, and his name is. Uh, Paul Martin, I met him some time ago um, with through a mutual friend, uh, Richard Allen Miller, and I just really, from the get-go, really just dug Paul, just really liked his stories and what his interests were, and so we've just hit it off as friends ever since. So, Paul, are you with me? I sure am. Woohoo! So, Paul has retired from one job and now is doing... <laughs> Instead of retiring, he's transitioned to another job at a dispensary. Um, are we catching you at the dispensary today? 
No, I uh, I've got to go down and do inventory later on this afternoon. But uh, uh, it, one of the things we can talk about is the Green Rush in Oregon. I've seen it from uh, several angles now, and uh, it, it's just an amazing story. It's it's essentially the same thing as the old gold rush in California. Well, awesome. Talk to us about that. Start us off. Well, well okay. When uh, Oregon legalized marijuana, everybody and their pet dog came out here. I, of course, because I was in compliance and enforcement, saw it from the compliance and enforcement um, perspective. In Josephine County, we have a fair number of legal marijuana grows that went through the OLCC, but we have a we also have uh, medical marijuana grows that are administered through um, the uh, Oregon Health Agency. Uh, so we have two conflicting regulatory agencies to begin with there. In addition to that, we had all kinds of issues with state and um, and with local ordinances, uh, primarily, uh, trying to uh, control marijuana. The area I live in is, is one of the primary areas for producing marijuana, uh, along with Humboldt County down on the coast to the south of us. Uh, it always has had a huge number of illegal grows, uh, even and even now after uh, legalization, we think there's a probably close to a thousand illegal grows in Josephine County alone. Um, <clears throat> everybody came in here thinking they could get rich really quick. They bought lots of land. They did all kinds of flaky things, most of which I can't talk about, uh, simply simply because. The, the the confidentiality rules are there. But I've seen families throw family out of properties. Uh, uh, I've, I've, I've seen uh, several inter- incidents of con artists. I uh, sometimes eat at a little place down here in Grass Pass called um, Sunshine Foods. It's a great uh, natural food store, organic product store. And um, uh, I was sitting there having lunch and there were three Israelis in uh, in the store in the booth next to me, and there was a fellow running a patter I hadn't heard in 20 years. He kept complete control of the conversation. He told them exactly what what uh, what he wanted to uh, to get out to them. None of which sounded very good to me. I had to leave, and I finally told the waitress, "Ma'am, when you can <laughs> when you can break into that conversation, because the guy really was practicing circular reading." Uh, you um, uh, you should tell those folks from Israel that uh, that the uh, the man they're sitting with is a con artist. Uh, I've seen it from that end to to mega entities. Um, one of the things that I had to try and do was get as many of the businesses registered as as possible, the marijuana farms registered as possible. And my boss has asked me for a progress report on that, and I said. Well, you and I will both be dead and buried before we have all of these people registered with the resources we have to work with. So there, there has definitely been a uh, a limitation in terms of um, how much how much uh, regulation can go into the into the process. Uh, we we really are kind of the wild west out here in in southwestern Oregon. Uh, the marijuana, as I say, everyone got into it, everyone produced, everyone overproduced. As I recall, the price dropped from about $1,500 a pound at one point to about $350 a pound. Uh, the, uh, a, a lot of people were shaken out uh, when, when that happened. Um, some of the operations now are, are switching over from um, from THC marijuana to hemp for CBDs, which I'm a firm believer in. It's the only reason I'm walking today. But uh, the the bottom line is that some of those people are trying to recoup their losses in that way. However, 
I think we're going to have the same kind of problem in terms of overproduction uh, occur with the hemp that we have with the uh, with the uh, uh, with the actual cannabis. the The problem with hemp is that it's a it's a wonderful material. Both of these both of these plants are incredible plants, and they they are very very beneficial to us. But but they have been suppressed for roughly oh, I don't know, 90 years, somewhere in there. Big Pharma got a hold of this and, and really did try and suppress it. Um, the, uh, the infrastructure to process everything that's being produced is what's open in my mind to question. Um, I, I just don't know how it's all going to get to a market and to be used. So I suspect the same thing is going to happen happen there. I've got two marijuana grows, three marijuana grows within walking distance of my house, and um, uh, two of those have now put in huge fields of hemp. So we'll see what happens. It's, it's certainly interesting, and um, I'm going to be managing a, uh, a marijuana dispensary on the other end of this situation with uh, uh, basically flim-flam activities. Uh, a fellow I used to chase years and years and years ago, uh, he finally straightened up, flew right. He wound up getting in with some uh, uh, some flim flam artists, and the fellow walked out of the out of the place with at least a six inch stack of bill of, uh, of currency, and God only knows what else. We're in the middle of um, of uh, dealing with uh, the inventory issues and and trying to put things together so that we can save this guy's uh, livelihood. Otherwise, he loses everything. Um, it's kind of a kind of a uh, uh, kind of a uh, a variation on the old store scam when the mom and pop stores went away here in uh, uh, in the Pacific Northwest. There were a bunch of scam artists that came through and said, "Well, I'll tell you what. I'll buy the store from you." So they'd buy for a small amount down sell all the inventory, and then sell all of the uh, fixtures and fittings as well. Uh, the worst one of those that I saw, there's a restaurant that used to be called the Waterhole, now called the Buckboard Grill, and literally one of the scam artists who did this to the fellow who had owned the building sold the windmill out from underneath him, and uh, it, it was amazing. Same kind of thing here. So... So that's what I'm doing now. So much for retirement. Yeah, well, so much for retirement. <laughs> that sounds like a pretty crazy story. Yeah, no. Um, oh. I was shocked, you know, when I went to Oregon. So, you know, Reno, we, since 2010, you know, kind of have been called the next Detroit, the next little Detroit. Um, and so, you know, we have like the largest homeless population, um, you know, in the nation. And so when I came up there and I was hanging out with Linny uh, and we were trying to help this piece of land and start getting food growing and stuff like that, I, I was actually shocked that Oregon was worse than Reno, you know, as far as economic situation. And yes, well, that's, that's, that's true. Oregon is, um, with the exception of Portland and, and the Willamette Valley, Oregon is essentially an internal colony of the United States. I don't know whether you've, you've come across that concept in the past or not. No, uh, can you explain every, that? Yeah. Internal yeah. colony? When... when yeah, an internal colony. When when you have a uh, when we went out and went exploring, we'd take over a place, and either we would put in some kind of ruler there from from us, and all we did was take the resources from that place, whatever it was, copra, uh, oil. See, I wonder where that comes from. Um, copra oil. Uh, what were what were some of the uh, the other ones, um, anything that you could extract. If we, if it wasn't part of 
a nation state itself, and primarily if it had an indigenous, quote-unquote, primitive uh, culture, that's what happened. Other places, like in the United States, as we expanded, and I'm really amused at, at uh, trying to trying to buy Greenland from Denmark. I thought that was pretty hilarious. But we have a history. Most much of our history had to do with buying land from foreign countries. So I mean, we do have the precedent here. We we bought most of the most most of the land we had. Whether we bought it from the proper owner or not is again something open to, to debate. But in any event, when you come out to some place like Oregon, we we are funded and financed mostly by people on the East Coast, old money, old piles of money. When you talk about the Cokes or the Popes or the Singers or anything like that, you're not really necessarily talking about one person. Robert Mercer is one exception to that. But huge piles of money, and they have a human face on them. Those piles of money come out here and invest, but very little of the money that's invested and the return on that money is sent back. It, it, very little of that stays in the place where it's invested. It all returns to wherever the huge pile of money is. And, and so as a result, yes, we have a governor. Yes, we have a, a, a state legislature. Yes, we're citizens of the United States. But when you look at us uh, economically, we are essentially an internal colony of, of uh, the eastern United States. And, and that's basically the way we behave. We have the boom cycles, the bus cycles, and all of that. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, Reno, I think, kind of falls, you know, most of Nevada probably falls in that, too, because, you know, we've had the gold and silver boom to bust, you know, like our whole yeah. Reno is very Absolutely. boom to bust. It's like a roller Absolutely. coaster ride. <laughs> it's like a yep. circus. Well, and then you've got, you've got cattle and you've got timber. Every industry, every industry that, that has been, has worked out here generally has been an extractive industry where at some point uh, the the land is used up don't get me started on the spot at all the the timber industry was uh, was brilliant in uh taking taking the fact that their big head rigs won't take a six inch or a 12 inch tree apart in a sane way and uh uh and blamed the failure of the timber industry, not on an unwillingness to retool, but on environmental concern. And again and again and again, probably as we go through the conversation, you're going to hear me talking about that kind of stuff. But the, the bottom line is that, uh, again, it was a, that was a huge flim plan. Um, spotted owl, yes, it was a triggered species, but the reason the, the reason the timber industries didn't get in, uh, didn't, stick around and retool was that it was cheaper to shut down their operations here, leave the people behind without good jobs, and move into the south. My cousins were timber fallers. They had a chainsaw, so, you know, it was ring, 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 lots of that noise, but they knew, you know, it was a chainsaw, and they knew that they had a job for life if they wanted it. The last cousin, now that I have in logging, uh, you know, this was like 40 years ago. The last cousin I have on logging now has a machine the size of a steam shovel. And if you take your arm and stick it straight out, it grabs the tree, it cuts it off, it turns it horizontally, it moves it over to a, a spot next to a deck, and it rolls the entire trunk of the tree through the, through the, uh, uh, through the gripper strips all the limbs off of it and stacks the tree on the stack to be um, to, to be going down to the uh, to the mill for milling operations. Um, it has changed completely. It's all fast growth timber. It's all happening in the American South. Most of the good timber that we had in the Pacific Northwest was sent to Japan in the 60s, 70s, uh, 80s and early 90s. You know, it was a dirty little secret, but it was used to to help uh, our uh, balance of payments, our balance of trade between the United States and Japan. 
over the years. Uh, and most people don't talk about that. Most people don't really see that that was what was going on, but it was. We sent unmanufactured logs to Japan, and then Japan did all of the milling and the manufacturing and all of that. Not the first time the Japanese have done something like that to people. Um, the Tokugawa uh, uh, period in Japan had a huge forest crisis, and they exported the problems overseas. Uh, Jared Diamond's uh, book, Collapse, uh, touches on that in an accessible way. But he missed the fact, and didn't he, he mentions it, but he didn't emphasize the fact, that they didn't really solve the problem, they just exported the problem. And again, that's the kind of thing that happens in a place like this. Now, with marijuana, a lot of money to be made probably isn't enough to support schools and all of that. Uh, maybe if it was all legal, but it's not. Yeah, I mean, did you hear, like, what's going on with the farm animals? I mean, it's kind of the same story about the unmanufactured um, trees that were being sent to Japan and processed. But same thing, they are they were loading, you know, huge cargo ships of farm animals, you know, chickens or sheep or sometimes mixed. There was, like, I think there was, like, some sheep and pigs and then they ship yeah. them across the ocean to China and they unload all these animals that were, most of them were alive when they were put on the ship. I just can't even imagine what a horrific journey that is for the animals and how much, I mean, the thing is like you wouldn't want to eat that meat because it's terrified meat. It has all kinds of chemicals and hormones and peptides in it of, of terror and fear. I mean, you know, I'm not trying to be a PETA person, but that's what happens when you have farm animals and you mistreat them is they live in really high stress and you don't really want to eat that kind of stuff that has a high, you know, um, cortisol production. You're, You're absolutely right. But, you know, remember that for the average American, food is not an agricultural product. Yeah, exactly. Food is an industrial product. And yeah. The, the, the people who are doing this, who are perpetrating this, let me, be, let me use the right word, the people who are perpetrating this are, are industrialists. Yeah. And they don't really think about those kinds of things. Yes, my heart goes out to the animals that that wind up in industrial farming, regardless of whether they go overseas or not. Yeah. Um, then, yeah, but, then they're... But it's it, it's yeah. all the same economics. It is. And then they're processed real quick, and then China sends them back in packaging, which means that the yep. meat has to be radiated harshly, and so it looks brand new, even though it's weeks and weeks, maybe even a month old by the time it hits your supermarket shelf. And they got rid of the laws of that people, that they're required, you know, when asked to tell people where the meat came from, because, you know, they don't really even know. There's no tagging, yep. there's no uh, where that animal came from, there's none of that. It's all just a mixed mash, and whatever comes out, comes out, and that's what you get. Well, absolutely, and and you have to understand that that the lawmakers who pass this legislation are primarily funded by big industry. Um, uh, there's a there's a marvelous book called Dark Money by Jane Meyer. I think I've talked with you about it. If you haven't read it, I'd strongly urge you to read it. Another great book out right now is um, is a, a book um, called Democracy in Chains. And again, I highly, highly, highly recommend uh, uh, reading those books. It, it kind of takes the mask off, pulls the curtain back, so you see the guy pulling the levers and oz. Um, well, another it, thing... It, they're not only being paid, but there a lot of them are also have worked for those companies or have part of their financial means kind of wrapped up with those companies. So there's also the, the special interest and getting paid off. 
my happening. my favorite quote my favorite quote in the Texas legislature when they were reapportioning I'm gonna say in nineteen eighty, the comment was when they were setting up a representative that would literally represent the area where all the refineries is, the 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 proponent of it said, Well, why shouldn't big oil have its own representative in Congress? And and you know that's that's how far we've come in in terms of in terms of thinking. Yes, that goes on both in the executive branch and in um, in Congress. In Congress, it's more likely to be a staffer uh, uh, on on somebody's staff that has a lot of pull with a congressman or a senator. In the pro- in the in the executive branch, what would happen? And and I've seen this happen in my own agency. Uh, a person starts with the agency, they show promise, they, they are invited into a private sector entity that the agency regulates, they work in there for several years, and then they go back to the agency that they were with originally that, again, is the, is the, uh, is the business that the agency regulates. And that can happen seven or eight or nine or, or ten times. When you look at somebody like Wilbur Ross, when you look at any number of other um, uh, uh, people in an administration, and this is Democratic and Republican, okay? When you look at these appointees, you have to see where they've been and what what they're doing before you before you, you approve them. Of course, the current shotgun system we have, uh, uh, if you're a Republican, you've got a pulse, you can be a judge. Um, the, the bottom line, though, is that that goes on in both administrations and is a really serious problem. Ed Valiantaros, uh wrote a, a really good book on um, <clears throat> what was going on at the FDA with uh, the approval process. And again, I'd strongly recommend reading him as well. Uh, yes, it's a problem. It's a problem top to bottom. And as long as we have Citizens United in place, as long as we allow money to be the primary uh, means of getting somebody elected into our government, we're going to be facing these problems and having these problems. Yeah, yeah, no question about it. Yeah, and on a state level, nope. I did a I did a huge amount of citizen lobbying in 2009 through the whole thing. There was eight of us that were non-paid, you know, citizen lobbyists. Seven of them were representatives from really conservative networks. Um, I was not. I was being attacked for my private practice for no reason, and they were helping me because there was a bill that was going to shut down everything in the state of Nevada. Any, even massage would have been gone. Um, you would have had to have a prescription from a doctor to have anything as supplements. You know, it was like a pretty major takeover. But we were up against 890 paid lobbyists, 1,500 bills, um, in a six-month period. And uh, it was shocking. At one point, I kept providing research for this woman who uh, literally she was a waitress at Denny's for 25 years. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with being a waitress, but no education. Um, And somehow her family talked her into, because they had some money, um, getting her into the Senate, becoming a senator, you know, um, on a, a lower level, you know, kind of in Nevada. And um, she literally said to me at one point, because she was getting really angry that I was showing up <laughs> to her committee a lot because there were bills that I really did not like and had to fight against. But she finally said at one point on record, on camera, that she didn't really care that she has been known to go against all constitutional rights and she didn't really care um, if that happened, you know, because basically, you know, there were other interests involved. 
And that's when I was like, that's the moment that it hit me that how deep the corruption is and that they don't care what we have to say or what we think. They're blatant about it these days. <laughs> Nancy, Nancy McLean, um, uh, again, wrote Democracy in Chains. And she got into the Koch Brothers funded university. And as I understand it, and please, I'm pulling this all from my, from my memory, okay? Uh, uh, dear listeners, yeah, please, please be gentle. Um, but she was, when George Mason University was created and then um, funded, as I recall, the school, the, the advanced school of business, whatever it was, as I recall, the original building that they were in, um, they left most of their working papers in there, and she was given access to that. And Democracy in Chains comes from that research. And, and I'm sure I don't have the story exactly right um, as, as far as that goes on the provenance of it, but it's in the book. And I would, I would strongly urge you and your listeners, again, to, to read that. Um, yeah, and, and there, are, there are case after case after case of situations like the one you just described, Bridget. You know, it's, it's pretty, pretty endemic in our, in our society. It was already bad before Citizens United and after Citizens United, you know, just just hang it up unless your name is Mellon or or DuPont or or something like that. But that brings me back around to why hemp took over all of a sudden. Now now first of all, understand I, I firmly believe that that CBDs are a pure godsend and that as a plant in a proper um in a proper industrial cycle, the industrial use of hemp can replace many, many environmentally damaging things that, that, that we currently use. If you do, if you are part of the industrial food chain, it's a great animal feed. Um, it can, to some degree, replace some plastic, um, as far as that goes, and and on and on and on, in addition to the deep medicinal qualities of the of the various um, compounds in the in the plant, um, but again, the the problem is going to be infrastructure. One issue that that came up. Did you notice how the the feds all of a sudden legalized hemp, Bridget? You know, it was it was nowhere, it was, was nowhere, and then all of a sudden it was legalized, right? Well, yeah, but it was a while ago, and I think that um, I think if I remember correctly, um, I was picking up a lot of it that was going on in Kentucky news out of Kentucky um, during kind and of my guess, legislation. Guess why? Guess why? Why? Give me, give me a wild guess, and then well, I'll, oh, okay. I think. Well, I mean, there's well, so I don't know. I don't well, know why they all of a sudden legalize it. You tell me. <laughs> Here's here's why. Big tobacco has been on the ropes forever and ever and ever. Um, you know they have a declining declining clientele. They have a declining uh, 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 new number of people coming into the business, at least here in the continental United States. And the tobacco equipment for handling tobacco, the infrastructure for handling tobacco and handling um, uh, hemp is virtually identical. And so it was a market that big tobacco could shift over to fairly easily without having um, having a, a huge retool cost like the the milling companies would have had up here when uh, when the old growth logging uh, had to stop, um, and the from from the cedars on up, the process the process 
for handling this material is there. So the infrastructure is there in Kentucky. It's there in Tennessee. It's there, you know, all across the South, wherever, wherever tobacco was grown. Um, and and that's why. Okay. So it's like kind because of an attempt to replace the losing tobacco industry with now the new hemp industry. It's amazing. And Moscow Mitch was able to get it right through the Senate. Isn't that incredible? You know? Yeah, because I, I was reading a lot about the stuff that was coming out of Kentucky during that time frame. And um, it was the new hope for all the Kentucky farmers that were like out of business. And they yeah. were saying like this would help them. But then there were all these problems. I don't know if they're growing hemp now, but they were facing all these kinds of weird legal problems because it was not, it was legal federally or something like that, but then it wasn't legal on a state level or they legalized yeah. it first before it was federally legalized. They and, legal. then they, and then the feds yeah. were coming it's, in and bothering them. And so a lot of the farmers just kind of gave up because they were like, this is just, you know, it's just not working out either. We just want to get something in the ground, you know, like, can we just yeah. get in the ground yeah. and see what happens next? And honestly, you can't blame the farmer. Um, you can't blame the farmer for, for being in that place, in my mind. You know, uh, with without agriculture, even if it's industrial agriculture, our society would cease to exist in 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 four days or less. Um, that's that's just that's just reality because we all do eat. And very few of us, myself included, pr produce enough food to to sustain themselves and their families. You know, that's that's just yeah, the that's reality a big, of our of yeah, our society. With a, a lot of the urban farm builds that I did around certain areas, and then summers I was going after I got out of biodynamic school at Rudolf Steiner, and I was traveling trying to build food productions for people, you know, um, and it was so shocking to me that um, people just weren't really interested in um, growing their own food, not even well, like 25%. Yeah. It was just what shocked me because they can, can buy it, but it's still not as good, right? Like it, lettuce yeah. goes three days after, you know, I tell people all the time, three days after lettuce is picked it loses all of its nutritional value so the only way you can Square actually tomatoes. you know get nutrition yeah. is yeah. to grow it yeah well it's so much better you know have a strawberry out of my strawberry bed yeah um uh you know it's it, the 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 fruit just simply explodes in your mouth um so yes and that's much better had i retired early I probably would be raising enough food here to uh, to uh, uh, sustain myself, but even even so, um, I'm one person, and that's not that's not going to uh, solve the problem for my neighbor who ran a store for forty years, or or the the neighbor's kids who live up the road who who. Uh, uh, work at an RV place and and do uh, uh, title work for for houses. Um, they're just the the society is too entrenched in this kind of industrial activity. Um, even though we live in the country, you know, you you've been here. You know, even though we live in the country, we're not in mile high skyscrapers or anything. We're just we're just living in our in our homes on three or four or five acres and uh, are still tied completely to the industrial agriculture system. Yeah. And that, uh, you know, I saw a um, paper, uh, I was living in Taos, I think it was like 2006, some, 2007, something like that. Um, and I met Keith McHenry, who's one of the original mm -hmm. founders of Food Not Bombs. And I ended up sitting on a think tank for like a world peace conference. New Mexico was willing to put up like quite a bit of money to start it, right? This world peace conference, right. blah, blah, blah. Anyway, 
I started working with him and he put together this special center in town of Talos where you know, there were all these documentaries, we'd have documentary nights, we'd have these like lengthy conversations, always around soil, food, you know, homelessness, you know, just a lot of other stuff. And started reading a lot of these documents that came out in 2006 that the government funded through different universities like Harvard and different places through economic, you know, professionals, right? PhD professionals. Right. And the one that I saw... Um, talked about uh, two economic professors from two different, you know, Ivy League colleges worked on it for a period of like five years. And it was a study on what would happen as soon as the U.S. dollar collapsed. And I remember reading that and was shocked. Number one, I was shocked at that obviously it's going to happen because if the government is looking into what, you know, the PhD economic professors thought about it, you know, what their statistics of what would happen means that it's coming down the pike, number one. And number two, I was astonished at what they put in the paper. And the paper basically said that within 30 days to um, five years, you know, they suspected like three quarters of the population of the United States would die due to starvation because we were not really growing food in the United States anymore. Um, and that, um, you know, you're not going to be able to get food. And the other thing too, now, since we have all this food shortages stuff that's starting to appear because the whole Midwest and the South, you know, are completely devastated. The old crops from last year, the Monsanto's crops even are floated away and been are gone. Nobody's been able to plant all of the livestock, the meat products, um, you know, all died, fled. And, um, and so now we're coming into a crisis that even if you did have money, we, we're looking at the potential, you know, hitting maybe this winter that you might not be able to buy food, even if you had money. And then the whole economic thing. And I don't think people really realize, like, how much their lives are tied into food, and how little of it is actually being produced, <laughs> you know? Um, I mean, like, nowhere, nowhere are people producing food. And it shocks me being kind of, you know, in this whole farming thing and nutrition, eating food as medicine. I'm just shocked everywhere I go and travel that I don't even see in people's yards anymore. I don't even see buckets of a tomato plant. I mean, there's like absolutely zero nothing being grown. And that's a real problem. Part of what you're talking about here um, hasn't come to pass, but it's getting a little bit closer. Hang on for just one second. Sorry for the dead air. The, <laughs> the, the, problem, the problem that that we face in terms of currency and, and a collapsing economy has to do with the fact that um, we're one of, we used to be the, along with the British pound sterling, the reserve currencies of the world. So if, if everything went to heck in, uh, in um, oh, I don't know, we'll say Canada because I don't want to be racist, but uh, let's say everything went to heck in Canada. Well, the Canadian dollar would drop against the United States dollar. And all of the transactions that occurred um, between the United States and Canada or the United States and Mexico would be calculated in dollars because the dollar stays within a certain predictable range of value. And there have been two attempts to bounce the dollar off, three attempts really, um, I'm really convinced that was what was going on with the uh, with the Gulf War with Iraq. Um, was that Saddam Hussein was recognized? He was in an un, uh, untenable position. He had to practice some form of asymmetrical warfare, and the way he tried to do it was to destabilize the dollar. And that's when we started moving all kinds of heavy units over there and, and, and making life miserable for him and eventually killing him. The, the dollar has to stay within a predictable range 
for the economy to work. As long as the dollar is the central part of, of, the, uh, of the reserve currency. But over time, several other currencies have been added, and now the reserve currency is a basket. And uh, it includes, I believe, the Chinese renminbi. I've forgotten whether the Russian ruble is in there or not, but I think it is. And, and in any event, the, the value and the power of the dollar is being diluted by these maneuvers. That's one, one approach. The other approach is the BRICS, which is Brazil, Russia, um, India, and China trying to create... And South the, Africa. The, Don't forget South Africa. <laughs> and South Africa to try and, to try and create a, a new gold-based currency to replace all of this market basket of, of currencies as, as the reserve currency. And both of those represent a direct threat to the U.S. and the U.S. hegemony, uh, simply simply by existing, um, and if either of those take off and destabilize the dollar, then yes, you could have a lot of the situations occur that that you're describing. And it could become very, very, very difficult um, to to be here in. In my county, I was born and raised in Jackson County, next door to Josephine County. Uh, I was born and raised there, spent a lot of my life there. And one of the things that I studied was carrying capacity. And I found out in 1978, 1979, that we had crossed our, our absolute carrying capacity in the Road Valley. In other words, the ability to feed and water all of the people in, in the Rogue Valley. We, we crossed that capacity to feed and support ourselves in about 1970. Um, and I, I discovered this in 78, 79. Uh, so, so if there's a disrupt, disruption, um, then, then yes, bad things could certainly happen. And I'm sorry for the long way around to saying that, but hopefully it makes more sense now. Yeah, um, well, there that's, are... a, that's why I love you so much, is, and I love talking to you, um, because, you know, you are so well-informed. I just really love that about you. Well, thank you. Um, nobody can be too informed. You know, that's, that's the point, and, and it's, not for, it's not for wimps, you know. That's, that's the other piece of it. There's, there's just a lot going on, a lot of it is scary. Any number of things can happen, but I subscribe to the Buddhist way of thinking and, and, and just leave it at something will happen. You know, we have a, we have a fragile, we have a fragile uh, 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 economy. We have an incredibly fragile ecosystem. Both of them are being stressed remarkably right now. We'll see, we'll see what happens. Uh, you know, Guy McPherson may be right, and we may be the last generation. Um, uh, oh, you know, I was just thinking about him too. And, and uh, Randall Carlson, on the other hand, says Guy McPherson is an idiot. You know, and uh, and and so the argument goes goes back and forth, and we can get into into the the art of argumentation if you want to in these in these cases, but. But the the bottom line is that that all of all of this stuff is is uh, potentially a problem. I don't like doom porn. I don't know if you ever read my little missive on doom porn or not, but I I really don't I really don't like that where people are saying I have the answer and this is what you do if you pay me five hundred bucks, then uh, I'll show you the safe place to be. Well. Most of the things that that I see coming, if these people are correct, there really isn't any place to be. There's places to last a little longer, but but in the end, um, we may have to go to a complete reset and come back as microbes and and work our way uh, work our way back up into more complex organ organisms. It's not the first time it's happened on the planet. It yeah, may have to happen again. 
Yeah. If that's the case, well, you know, how, how do you tell your three-year-old what's going on? I don't know. And that's where McPherson helps, um, just in terms of practicing love, doing good things for the people around you, doing good things for the strangers around you, mentioning the homeless people, um, uh, doing all of these things and, and helping them as, as much as possible. Uh, I, I really don't like dust cults. I don't believe that that it does you any good. Um, uh, I was a uh, armor crewman in the army, um, and um, supposedly also a reconnaissance specialist, which basically meant that I was pretty good at scrounging parts from other vehicles when we had to. Um, but but uh, the bottom line is, you you live until you die, and and again, I think the Buddhists have it right from that perspective, that you may wind up having to come back again, but God only knows what you're going to come back as. And if if one of the other belief systems has it right and I have it wrong, more power to them, I'm happy for that, as long as their belief system gives them comfort in the kind of times we're in and the times we had a, are, are headed for um, pretty rapidly. Yeah, um, one of the but, things I think about... That- watched well i don't know i think it was like three years ago and dane wigington you know he's working with a lot of different scientists and i i think the reason why a lot of people have moved away from dane um i haven't i believe in dane 100 percent um uh really appreciate you know him spending his life trying to inform people about chemtrails um and everything else that goes along with it but i don't think a lot of people really liked his information that he was putting out which is kind of like mcpherson where there's you know i think three years ago dane was saying we had like eight years nine or eight years left um you know with oxygen and you know things like that because of trees so one of the things that i've really done during i mean this is just personal um and we're going to go to break in four minutes so you know Um, And then I'll just have you mute for five minutes and then come back at one after. Um, And then you can go do something that you want to do that you may need to do. No. (laughs) Um, But after that, I just really thought like, you know, if if there were nine years left, you know, how would I choose to live? And nature, you know, being in nature 100%. um, And so I've just... Everything that I've been doing for the last three years has been in nature. This year I took a, a wild crafting plant medicine course, but mostly to study plants that I could put into large-scale restoration projects, you know, to actually help soil and clean soil. I've been working in the native seed movement to use those plants as well, you know, to actually go in and heal large areas, you know, using seeds and plants and things like that. But I think like if I leave here and I have any memories of what this place was like, I I want those memories to be downloaded wherever they get downloaded so that other civilizations could see the beauty of trees and the beauty of plants and medicinal plants and the bees relationship to them. And, you know, that's kind of the positive part that I try to focus in on while I'm dealing with the end. Absolutely. And providing comfort to the people around you and recognize that not everybody is going to be operating at the same level. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's it. I'll let you talk us out of this, out of this segment. I will. I will. So So you got (laughs) <laughs> so, yeah, so it's Bridget Lynn Dolgoff. I'm your host of Caring Stones and Digging Holes radio show here on Revolution Radio Studio A. Um, I have a Wednesday show and a Saturday show. Um, Saturday show is 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And my Wednesday show today that you're listening to is noon Eastern Standard Time to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I'm talking to Paul Martin. And Paul Martin I met several years ago. And um, we've always just hit it off. And um, I just love Paul. And he had to retire before he could come on my show. 
So now, um, hopefully, he'll be a returning guest because we just love. He always says, "I don't know what to say. I don't think I have anything to say." And I'm like, "He has tons to say." I'm sure all of you get that out there. He's just an informative, beautiful spirit, and also, um, Lenny is listening. So Lenny has tuned in. <laughs> so then Lenny also knows Paul. Um, so anyway, we're going to be back in um, approximately, you know, five minutes at one after. So if anybody needs a break, promos will play. Uh, Paul, we might not be able to hear the promos, but we'll just mute out so the promos can roll. And that's it. All right. We're at break. See you back in five minutes. the matrix i've been waiting for you why am i here you are the eventuality of an anomaly which despite my sincerest efforts i have been unable to eliminate from what is otherwise a harmony of mathematical precision which has led you inexorably here you haven't answered my question the matrix is older than you know as you are undoubtedly gathering the anomaly is systemic creating fluctuations in even the most simplistic equation. Choice. The problem is choice. Right here at Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. Be here Wednesday evening at 8 p.m. Eastern Time for Private Eye Matrix Revealed with Monique Lassonde. Back, back, back. Schedule will be on Revolution Radio every Saturday night, 6 to 8 p.m. You get outer space. You get honest answers, real researchers, truthful answers, and a place to engage with questions. Take part in the discussion. Revolution Radio on FreedomSlips.com host Collision Course every Saturday from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Mountain Time, and 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Pacific Time. Extendivite really works. Just listen to what some people have to say. Several years ago, I was developing a very uh, severe situation. I called it my flippy heart. It would just was doing not good things, and I did not want to go to a medical doctor because uh, I just knew they would give me a cover-up pill. I didn't want to get onto that sort of thing at all. When I learned it was garlic and cayenne, and cayenne is a healer. It is a wonderful herb. I said, I think I'm onto something here. I'll tell you, I wouldn't be without it. It did wonderful things for me. Extendivite is only $69.95 for a two-month supply of either capsules or liquid. Call now. That's 1-877-928-8822 or visit heartdrop.com. Extend your life with Extendivite. 
the opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host... All right, everybody. Hopefully, we're at the end of the promos. Uh, it is your host, Bridget Lynn Dolgoff, Carrying Stones and Digging Holes Radio Show on Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. You can go to our website, and you can find all kinds of amazing ways. Um, if you have a business, if you um, need some seeds, uh, if you just want to donate, um, if you want to pay for our archives, you can do all those kinds of things. Look under funding um, and see the ways that you can support us. Everything that everybody does here is 100% voluntarily. Voluntarily. <laughs> um, and we try to do the best we can to bring you insightful conversations and information and in some cases news news, and roundtable, um, you know, um, put together so that you could get lots of different people debating a subject. So uh, my show is on Wednesdays and Saturdays on Revolution Radio, and I'm in Studio A, the bee with the pollen on its legs flying to the flower. So we're in the second hour, um, and we're talking to a friend of mine, Paul Martin, um, and about all kinds of things all over the map, which my shows usually have that um, <laughs> have kind of a, a way of going all over the place um, and then ending back up at the original conversation, putting the pieces together. So, Paul, are you with me? I sure am. Awesome. All right. So what do you want to talk about the second hour? Well, first thing I want to do is say hi, Lenny. If you if you guys <laughs> haven't heard Lenny or met Lenny, the man is absolutely brilliant. Not every not every brilliant person winds up in a research institute or or other other kinds of, of hallowed halls of knowledge. And Lenny is one of those guys who is absolutely brilliant, who's out here walking his talk, being brilliant just among the lesser mortals like you and me. So hi Lenny. Yeah, um, he so um, there's my he, he did my show with Mona. Um, I was at Herb School this last weekend, and Mona is hosting my show, and Lenny's the guest every. And so they get to he gets to be on my show and powwow with Mona, helping me out um, while I'm gone. Oh, cool! Good. Yeah. Well, I'll try and listen to that. The the uh, you know we 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 talked a lot about how rotten things are, and mm -hmm. yeah, it's rotten. We could spend a whole another another hour or a couple of three days doing that. But how about something fun? I'm game. How does that sound? I'm game. Okay. So years ago, I used to do um, radio. I used to do public radio, and I used to do AM uh, for-profit radio. And I, I pro um, pioneered a format on the public broadcasting station I was with down here that was a program called Homegrown Art. And Homegrown Art uh, was an interview program with all kinds of different performers and artists. Now, um, musicians and storytellers and writers were pretty easy because that was all verbal, verbal conversation. And, and you could paint a pretty good picture of what was going on. And... Uh, Fabric artists, well, you couldn't show their product at the time because we didn't have the internet um, the way that you can, you know, pop up slides of, of whatever they were producing um, at the time that I was on the air. The best particular show I ever did that had the, the most amused and amazed people was when I brought a magician on air. And we did magic tricks on the air on radio 
Now, I tried to break into TV years ago, and they all told me I had a face for radio. But I can describe things pretty well. And <laughs> this magician, we spent a half hour doing magic tricks on the air, and I would do a play-by-play of what he was doing, whether it was a card trick or a coin trick or whatever it was. And then he would do something absolutely incomprehensible and come up with the the finale on the trip. And I couldn't help myself. I had to say, how did you do that? And he'd just look at me and smile and say, very well, thank you. Right? Never did give me a a single secret to his to his magic tricks. And we've got a lot of stuff in the world where I look at it and I say, how did they do that? Well, some of the stuff that's modern technology, you can explain it. That's fine. But the further back you go, and when you get into into megalithic um, uh, structures, well, then I get into this same situation. How did they do that? How could they do that? And, of course, I'm not unique in this in any way, shape, or form. Um, Graham Hancock uh, has written a lot about it. David Forrester has written a lot about it. A number of, uh, you know, any number of other people um, have, have gotten into that. But I came at it from a little bit different perspective. Back to you, um, having grown up here in southwestern Oregon, having having had the ties that I've had with the with the communities that uh, that I've been with, and I want to start off by saying I don't know how they did that, and any number of thoughts and ideas could be right. Having said that, <clears throat> I'm still not convinced that space aliens from the planet Zircon came down and and taught us how to do this. Yes, there are stories of space brothers, and there are other things along those lines um, that may, in fact, that may, in fact, have something to do with that. But we've been around for a quarter of a million years, and this is the best we can do? I don't think so. I think that we are... Uh, um, a society that has gone through a, a species that has gone through um, uh, a whole series of, of rises and collapses. We've seen that in our own history from, from let's say, eight to 10,000 years ago to present. How many times have societies collapsed? How many times have empires collapsed? We were just talking about, about the dollar being a reserve currency. And when that goes to China or wherever it goes, well, then our empire is probably going to collapse. Will it collapse the civilization? Possibly. We talked about that. So we have these huge megalithic structures around the world. Um, uh, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll send you to, to, to Forrester. I'll send you to Graham Hancock um, uh, uh, as two people that come to mind as I'm talking about this. Um, uh, Also, Michael Tellinger down in uh, South Africa. I think he's on the right track. But I think that we had an advanced society, an advanced civilization that was homo race, whether it was uh, homo neanderthalus, homo, uh, you know, the denote, Denethovians, uh, whether it was sapiens or whether it was all together, I, I, I don't have a clue. I don't know. But I'm absolutely convinced that we had some, uh, some ability in some of us that allowed us to manipulate matter. And I'm convinced that this was a, a residual um, a residual sort of trait that survived among some people who survived the disaster. Now, that almost sounds science fiction, doesn't it? I apologize for that. But here's why I think that. 
Um, I'm, a, I'm a pretty hard-nosed sort of guy. And George, you may be right. So close, you know. It, it may be alien. There is... There, there were many native people who survived here after the last, um, after the last deluge, after the last collapse, um, and there are uh, flood stories all up and down the west coast of the United States. The native people among the Klamath and Shasta people, um, just south of, of where I live. Um, were people who who can who who were close to the land, who had lived for um, at least ten thousand years close to the land. They may have been survivors of something far greater, but only bits and pieces survived. If our society sur- uh, collapsed today, we'd only have bits and pieces. Um, Richard Miller and I used to talk about survivalism a lot, and I said, well, Rick, that's fine, but can you build the transistors and the integrated circuits inside that cell phone? If we get knocked back, we're going to get knocked back to at least 1800, and maybe before that, just because we don't have the technologies available to bring ourselves up to the, to the current level. The same thing, I think, happened with the, with the people from before. And I think that we had talents and abilities that we have somehow lost in most people today. Or it may have been some kind of a genetic bloodline that, that carried it. I don't know. I don't know. Like I say, most of this, I don't know. The physical evidence of this, Tom Doty, a Native American storyteller who is as Irish as I am, and I went out on an adventure one day many, many, many years ago. And um, he and I had come across uh, the story of the Rain Rock. And the Shasta people and the Klamath people and most Native peoples believed that one part of their job in the universe was to help the seasons move on and on and on and on. And so, for example, they they would have, uh, they being the Shasta, would have um, uh, a convocation at a point of focus to call spring, to call the spring run of Shabbat, to call summer, to call a a summer, uh, the, the summer of deer, and the, the summer of fruits and berries, the calling of the fall, or or the uh, or the the calling of um, the the fall run, you know, the call of the winter, you know, or the time for all things to rest. All of these all of these things were cyclic, and they had a focus for this. It took a while to put it all together. Um, I'm very good at at researching, and Tom is very good at at, at ferreting out stories. He has a website called DodieCoyote.com. I hope that you'll uh, go look at that, DodieCoyote.com. That's the only plug I'll put in today, Richard. Um, Brilliant writer and uh, a brilliant storyteller. The the rock was dug up many, many years after the Native people abandoned it and uh, was moved to a little town called Fort Jones, California. And it's still there. The Rain Rock is what it's called now. And all kinds of stories blew up around it and all of that. But it's a great big, huge granite boulder. And it is poked full of holes, Bridget. Have I told you this story? Yes, it's, and you know, after you get done telling the story, I heard this from you like, I don't know, three or four years ago, and it really has changed how I look at native native work on stones. Because I live in one of the areas that has the oldest, you know, petroglyphs and hydroglyphs in North America. Uh-huh. So I, mm-hmm. I'd love to tell you about what I've learned from this story <laughs> in my life. Okay. But go ahead. I love this story. It's such a great story. Yeah, so, so in any event, 
I did all the all the research I could do in Fort Jones, and understand that uh, in addition to the rain rock, there's all the whole wall is done with nothing but uh, um, of, of the of the museum is is nothing but mortars and pestles of the of the local needy people. Um, so from one perspective, and, and frankly from my perspective, when I when I walked in there, I was a bit horrified. It might as well have been human skulls. Um, typically, you leave your mortar and your pestle where it will be used by yourself or the next person that comes along in the next season. So, so in any event, we started to do some some research to figure out where this rock came from. But the key piece was we ran our we we put our thumbs into the hole. Uh, a hole on the on the uh, on the rain rock, and like I say, it was riddled with these holes, surface holes. And it would you you would stick your thumb down into the rock, into a piece of solid basalt, all the way up to your joint where your hand came in it, and you'd swirl it around, and it was kind of a scooping motion, and come out. And it became obvious to us that that was what had been done with the rain rock is that people had been somehow sticking a thumb in, spinning it, and uh, and pulling their thumb out and leaving a hole in the rock. We ran into a Shasta medicine woman later in the day. She was out grabbing, uh, gathering herbs. And of course, me being red-headed, blue-eyed, and, and, and all of that, and Tom being dark, and Belgie's a Native American storyteller. We we asked her about this, and she was polite with us. And she said, "Well, we we really don't know because we lost so much in one day." And of course, she looked right at me um, at that point. the The entire Shasta tribe was wiped out in a day. Um, they were called to council in the negotiation um, and said, uh, "Strict nine laced beef." The uh, the Klamath River had to be cleared so that gold miners could get in there without trouble, and that's how they did it. And poisonings were a pretty normal part of diplomacy between the whites and the, the Native Americans out here in the, from, from about 1860, 1870 on. Uh, both sides poisoned both sides, just so you know it was an equal opportunity sort of thing. But we, again, put together stuff. I did more research. And we found where the native village was, where the rock came from. And um, a, there was an overlay of a of a uh, of a mining camp that had been over it. But you could also see where the first people lived. It was at a junction of a of a stream and and uh, uh, this uh, and, and the Klamath River. You uh, would climb up above, and I was a student of Wallace Black Oaks, so, so for those of you who, who want some creds, I didn't learn a lot, but I learned some. And, and the, the, the area surrounding the village site had what looked to me to be an obvious vision quest site. It was a great big basalt shelf in cave in the walls, in the ceiling, in the ground, when Tom and I got up there, we found it again riddled with holes. And as near as we can tell, the way those holes were made, and again, no proof, um, were by running the thumb through the basalt to show that you had gained the power of, of whatever it is or whatever it was. And so many of these stones in in other parts of the world um, have have the appearance of being molded, um, having the appearance of of, uh, of uh, being fit so exactly that that you can't even slip a piece of paper through it. You can't you can't put a uh, anything between them. And I suspect that at one point, at least the masons of whatever culture was here before had that ability. 
And I, I really think that's the case. Now, I also think Michael Pellinger is, is on to something in terms of acoustics and, uh, and moving rock and acoustics and, uh, and drilling and things along those lines. We're just now getting to the point of where we're starting to look at Caesars and, and things like that as, as something other than a curious way to heat water. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that the way that these megaliths, at least in part, were built were a combination of sonic technology to move them, not anti-gravity or anything like that, possibly, who knows? Again, I could be totally wrong. But, um, uh, but that we had the ability both to shape rock and we had the ability to, um, uh, uh, to move it using sound and whatever this other residual ability um, uh, was. The, uh, uh, and I know that puts me way, way out there, but that's kind of fun stuff. How do they do it? Very well. And they won't tell me how they do it, but I think I know how they did it. Yeah, one of the things, you know, from hearing that kind of a story and then going out and, and you know, talking to different people, and this is before I met you, but in 2000, I want to say 2011, there was a Mayan elder man that came up to kind of the lower part of America, maybe like the, you know, west, southwest, right? And mm -hmm. he was talking about CERN, that his people knew about CERN 3,000 years ago, and that mm -hmm. he was teaching people how to make these deactivators to take the brunt of the damage that CERN was doing, you know, to the earth and all of the like, you know, little dimensional layers because it was puncturing holes and it was making the earth really unstable. Um, and so, but he talked a lot about how um, they look at like, you know, the way that they look at things like the, the ceremonies, the drums, rattles, the circles, you know, the altars, uh, you know, all of these different things is that they're actually technologies. And see, in our, our problem with our thinking, I was listening to this thing by Alan Watts the other day, and he was just so brilliant, that man. But he was saying, you know, like, our concept of wealth is this worthless paper. And we're driven for that worthless paper. And we don't even see what the worthless paper buys, which is the true wealth, which is the groceries in your cart. Something worthless purchase something of value which was in the cart the wealth is in the cart the shopping cart it isn't in the worthless paper that we're driven for and i think it applies to the same thing you know like most of us don't understand you know we have to have a machine or a computer that has knobs and all kinds of stuff on it that you know performs such and such and such and we call that technology but to the indigenous people worldwide, they have things that they were given, you know, millions of years ago probably, that were to harness power and energies um, that are technologies. And a lot of the ceremonies are technologies and their drums are technologies. And they, um, one lady that I st uh, was with briefly uh, for a stay over in Idaho was telling me about that all the different songs with drums and the way that they're said in, in the native way are different actual frequencies on a spectrum of a spectrum on the wheel, right? And they cover every, every type of frequency that would be needed, sound frequency. And so I started kind of starting to look more and more as I, you know, work with and, and, um, with native people and you know do this work myself is that um that these are technologies that we have um that we don't label as technology because technology has to look a certain way to us and i was um, thinking it go ahead well what you're saying is absolutely true you go ahead and finish your thought and then i'll i'll jump back in sorry yeah so one of the things that started happening after you and i had this conversation like four years ago about this rock weather rock 
um, I started after that, I started doing a lot of studying. I had a lot of, I had several native teachers that came into my life, medicine men, if you will, who I started learning from doing, that was driving me more into these, you know, indigenous technologies, right? So, um, one of the things I started noticing is I really started looking at a lot of the rocks um, and things around, and I started asking questions to my native teachers about it. And one of my native teachers said, well, create a rain altar and see what happens. You know, like create yourself a rain altar, and, and these are some ideas that, you know, you may want to use it for kind of in your mind, your intention, how you may want to activate it as a technology to change the weather, right? So I did. I created a total rainstorm or a stone altar and um, it took me a while to put it all together. And then, you know, I did the activation processes that he recommended. And I swear to God that that thing worked. It totally, it totally worked. It totally blew my mind. Like how effective it was bringing, you know, like rain right into the desert. Right. Um, and mm -hmm. I was shocked at how rapidly that it actually held. And when I lost track of thought during my activation of it, then usually what I had desired wouldn't manifest because I lost track of thought when I was imprinting it, you know, like, and I have people that tell me that UFOs, you know, they fly it through the, the mind of the being flies it. Right. And that the mind yeah. has to be straight. And so this is kind of like how this rainstone thing worked is if my mind wasn't straight, I didn't get the outcome. But if my mind was straight in the activation and the imprint of the visualization that I used for it, it totally happened. It totally 100% happened with rain. It was unbelievable. So then I started really looking at a lot of the stones and they have a lot of what they, what do they call them? The somatic symbols on them where you take a vibrational sound and then you put salt, you know, like on a, screen and that sound vibrates it into a form or a pattern like a geometrical mm -hmm. pattern mm -hmm. so i started really looking at a lot of these native places and looking at the stones and what were carved on them or what they drew on them uh plus i've been talking to a lot of other native people who people that are in the work of the native seed movement with the corn and there's a lot of um, stuff that's left on stones about who brought the corn here, uh, what it was meant to be used for, uh, how that it can actually heal the earth, you know, just different kinds of things. So I, I really started putting all this together and I really started to realize like when you see a stone, for example, one went missing. I used to visit it, it the Washoe people and it had a, um, the hydroglyph on it that was carved and it had one of those like symbols on it, like a cymatic kind of symbol. And what I realized is that somebody in the Washoe people did a ceremony and injected energy and power into the stone to who knows, regulate the weather. Maybe they needed something to actually, you know, ground something about the weather at the base of this trail. Well, one day I went in the, the arch um, it had a sign that the archaeology society, the federal government, removed the stone and put it in a warehouse for further study. All right, so they they totally came with a big had to come with a big machine, pick the stone up and then put the sign there. So, and I and I thought to myself, you don't even know what that may have been helping this area with, and so I started to realize like. A lot of these stones that they have these symbols and stuff on are to control or help that environment. And so I think about like those thumb hole marks and stuff in the stones. And I think, what if those are knobs? But because we, we have to have a knob that's on the outside, it's an inner knob. And you take your fingers and you move it to change the weather to change it from night to day, to, uh, you know, um, bring, you know, a little bit of rain, turn the rain off, um, you know, uh, increase a frequency to help the trees, lower a frequency, you know, um, what if those are knobs? What are those thumb holes 
and so this is kind of like from, it's kind of cool to talk to you about this because you kind of, you know, were part of me being egged on about this whole process and my thinking about it. But I, I, now I'm starting to think that maybe those groove holes with the thumbs and stuff like that are more the knobs. Like they're used, they feel turning things up, turning things down. Um, you know, being able to do a lot of different kinds of things. And so like you have a cave where somebody's doing a vision quest and you have the medicine person that goes in and turns things on exactly how they need to be turned on in the vibration of that cave for the specific person to have the exact well, journey. Yeah, that's entirely possible. Um, uh, again, I, I certainly cannot claim to have any, yeah, any yeah. deeper than, than, than that. And again, as a Buddhist, the, the world is a place of infinite possibility. So to me, it's all possible. What I can say about um, the, the Native peoples, uh, from my perspective, and, and in particular, the, the places I've looked at, is that these devices typically did, and let's call them devices, okay, instead of a rock. But the, the, the various ceremonies that were, pre, that, that were performed and the various focuses that these devices typically represented, because, you know, I can't say turn it five, five microns this way and you'll get, you know, X and 10 microns this way and you'll get Y. But what I, what I can say is that these were a focus for the rituals that these people went through. When the white man came and overran the native peoples, you see a recurring theme. And, and I'm sure that some of our native peoples who are, are far more um, listeners, who are far more uh, uh, deeply into this can probably lay out even even more. But the, the piece that I can that I can say is that the natives attempted to use these as nukes, Native American nukes. The ghost dance was a Native American nuke. It was designed to turn the time back to return the universe and the continent to a place where when the white man wasn't here, when everything was good. The same thing with the rain rock. The rain rock was used, attempted to be used as a Native American nuke to wash the white man out. Um, that, that I'm reasonably certain of in, in both those cases. And, and you can find the same kinds of things in, in, uh, in other traditions. I'm just not really well versed in them. So, so I can't really comment beyond right. that. Right. Well, this is the thing is like, okay, so sometimes the belief is more powerful than the fact, right? We see that in Placebo. Right effects like people think that they're getting a certain medicine and they're not getting anything and they totally cure their own disease yep. so this is the fact that the native people believed and who knows the ghost dance may have worked but maybe it is a time continuum thing right maybe maybe yeah, maybe that on. part of that is taking place now with eradication it all depends post- on your frame yeah. yeah it depends on your frame of reference yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so there's you know. this, so I'm in this herbal, you know, while crafting herbal medicine program. I just finished the first section of it. And one of the things that, you know, also, it's also teaching me a lot about this other stuff that I've been looking at, you know, with the rocks and the, the devices and the technologies and and the what I call the organic technologies, right, and the the biological technologies, right, that are in the, in, in this whole thing, right? So, um, one of the things, uh, we go out, you know, every, we do like 
um, once a month we come together and we have all these classes and then we usually do this huge nature walk and we plant identify. We sometimes make medicines right there on the fly um, and just all kinds of stuff. And one of the things I'm starting to realize is like it's more of the subtlety of the plant, these subtle natures. That's why like Bach flower remedy works so amazing it's because it's the subtlety, right? The, the subtle vibrations, right? These energies. And so plants are devices, right? That when we come in what? contact with them, they in our energy field, just the fact that they're there, we don't even really have to harvest them. This is the subtlety part that I really learned this summer. But we went on this um, hike. We went up to this place called Lindsay Lakes. And it's part of the class. It's called the summer camp out. And you go up there. I was up there like five days. And then every day we go up on different parts of the hikes to look at the different, you know, ecology at different levels. You know, what's growing, what's not growing. Um, I fell in love with buckwheat, wild buckwheat. Oh, my God. I love that, those plants. Anyway. Um, Isn't that good? Oh, so beautiful. Oh, my gosh. They are so unusual and, and beautiful. Um, just incredible. But anyway, so we're on this one nature hike. And if my teacher pulls leaves and stuff off during her talk and hands them out, I and they're edible, I eat them. I just do. I'm just, I'm curious. I, I want to test it. Sometimes I come home with major herbal hangovers for like a week. Um, and this one particular plant, the angelical plant, which is used by the native people, the root for um, stamina and endurance, you know, for ceremony stuff, right? Ceremony work, especially when they're doing, you know, long ceremonies that benefit everything, right? These ceremonies benefit everything and everyone. Um, and then they won't drink water. They don't eat. There's a lot of different kinds of things. And then a lot of times they'll dance, Anyway, so they use the angelical root to chew on to help with getting to the end of that ceremony, you know, finishing it and being able to keep the endurance and stamina that they need. So she pulled these plants off and I have this habit of macerating them in my hands sometimes. I smell them, you know, and and get them all mashed up and then I put them, you know, in my bra, let it heat up and see what kind of smell I get. Plus, I can find out if I'm going to be allergic to that plant or not because if I get a rash that tells me that that plant's not for me. You know, it's an easy, simple way that I can do that, that I've kind of learned since I was a little kid to do. Um, but I, so I take this macerated, you know, by hand, angelical, you know, leaf plant. I stick it in my bra. It's heating up, all this stuff. About, I don't know, 40 minutes goes by. And we're talking about this other plant. And I just start coughing. I mean, I cannot stop. I can't stop coughing. And I can feel like something rolling up my lung. And so I look back. I look back over um, my notes to see what plants um, that I may have eaten, you know, during the course of the last, the start of the walk to see if anyone had anything to do with lungs. And none of them did. But there was this one thing, a catchphrase, that angelica root is used to catch your breath right? That's kind of like the, the signature catching your breath kind of a thing. Um, and I realized that it was the angelical plant that, I mean, literally was helping me to release the stuff out of my lung, really old stuff, cough that stuff up to the point where I was so hoarse. I couldn't even talk for a long time. Um, and I was so surprised about the subtlety in that technology. That plant has a technology <laughs> a device, you know, like we could even consider like a machine, you know, like something that you would go like a barbaric chamber where you would be stuck in and oxygen's forced into you. Well, this plant has similar abilities. You know, it's releasing what is wrong with my lungs that's keeping me from stamina, from endurance, you know, why I can't catch my breath, dealing with respiratory stuff. And it fixed me by just kind of going into my energy field and my bloodstream through my skin. And Don't I was tell just, Big Pharma about it. I was Don't just, tell Big Pharma about it. <laughs> You'll never be able to use it again. Yeah, but I'm just saying, you know, like we, we don't realize that 
all of this whole thing is set up it's already has all the technology necessary the devices necessary but they're not what we're trained to think they are and we have to rethink well, our thoughts about that absolutely i i couldn't agree more and again the subtlety is there I, i'm trying to remember whether it was arthur c clark or asimov who said that that any technology sufficiently advanced uh, becomes indistinguishable from magic and and i think that i think that that's part of of what we're we're experiencing here with this and i do think that some people are attuned just like we have people who are good at math and good people who are great writers and 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 all of that i suspect that we have subsets of of our people of our population who are attuned more to one of these things than the other um and i suspect that for you it's plants uh, uh as far as that goes but that again that's my thinking and i suppose it's an aside but there it is hi Lynn. yeah <laughs> Lenny, I don't know if he's still listening. I'm waiting for his Skype yeah. to come back up. But, you know, through that process, so I have some new friends. And, yes, they're Native people in um, Grass Valley that um, I'm learning, you know, some more stuff from. But um, the woman, she made me, uh, um, and I love this whole idea, a smoking blend, herbal smoking blend. And this one has um, mugwort, mullein, lavender, rose petals, and blue blue lotus in it and it's all dried and it's all ground together and then i just roll them you know and smoke them um but i can't tell you like how much this stuff is healing my lungs from um all kinds of you know different angles and releasing like congestion in my ear that i've had since childhood you know stuff that um and i would have never considered i mean you smoke pot right but I never would have probably even thought about since taking this class to actually roll some of these lung plants up and actually smoke them, right, for uh, the healing maybe, and disinfecting. Maybe you're becoming a true medicine woman. <laughs> maybe. I can't say for sure. I can't say for sure. But maybe, you know, you know, and and I hope I haven't offended any of your listeners today. You know, I, that that's the last thing in the world to that can be done. Where you and I have had empirical experiences that we we have we have undergone, like this one with your arms. Well, yeah, that's that's pretty straightforward and black and white. Why is it happening? I come back to my magic trick. It's happening very well, and I don't have a clue how it happens. You know. And that's 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 really where it is. You're you're learning exper experientially, and I'm pretty sure that's how we relearned whatever wisdom we lost in whatever catastrophe happened before. Yeah, and I, I just have to add, you know, my whole journey um, with a lot of my native teachers and the work and the plants and the soil and the you know medicines and all that other stuff um, has been a lifelong journey, and I. I'm so glad that while I was on this planet that that I could learn these things, you know, and um, and then be able to spend time to try to figure it out, how it works with me. You know, when I go out mm -hmm. and I look at the, the people want to call it native rock art or, you know, when it's actually real. It's, there's impressions that are, and frequencies that are left in these stones like even in the Russian, they talk about the megaliths that a lot of the ones, the dolomines or whatever, the dolmines or that 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 the ancient Dolan, yeah. the ancient story about that is that the ancient really wise people of certain civilization um, that I think are called the Vedras, which are really really old, and they actually built those stone megaliths, and most of them were were like um you know floor sidewalls top and that the person would actually decide to die in them 
And then they would, when they decided to die in them, they were going to leave all of their knowledge and wisdom, like a library in those um, rocks and that they would close the megalith with the door. So it was like a closed room. And then that person would die in there, but they would um, push all their knowledge and information, like a database, like a computer hard drive into those stones so that when people are really conscious, they could come by and actually touch them and be able to download whatever they could, you know, whatever could get past their personal filter um, into their own systems, so that information and knowledge was left behind. Yeah, and and you see again that that makes really good sense. One of the things that's going on right now with um, with computing, as I recall, is in terms of data storage. Uh, there, there's some people are working with. I want to say it was some form of concrete. I, I don't have the article here in front of me, but um, some form of concrete, and it apparently creates an incredible amount of data storage. So that wouldn't that would not surprise me at all. Um, and as, again, as I'm convinced, we've been here before several times, and there have been several several catastrophic changes um, over a quarter of a million years that that Homo sapiens has been around. Um, it, it really is just pretty obvious to me. Now, Sukhalos and his his bunch may be right. You know, there may have been aliens in, involved. There may have been um, uh, visitors here, and there may have been visitors that meddled with it. I suppose all of those things are possible. Again, infinite possibilities. But it doesn't rule out what you're saying. You know, it, it seems to me in the genetic history of Homo sapiens sapiens that about 70,000 years ago something really, really, really bad happened. and We got down to about 35,000 viable humans uh, on the planet and then we came back from that. Um, and, and again, I remember reading that um, and again, I think that it's it's all just cyclic, and I'm convinced that every time we come back and, and do something, we use a little bit different technology. I hope that we've never used what we're using now because it's awfully destructive um, to the planet and maybe uh, terminal for the species. I, I totally Sorry to agree. Again. Yeah, and you know, if I was an extraterrestrial person, I would have serious problems with what you know, I think a lot of these people, they get involved. And this is just my opinion. Oh, and Lenny says love to Paul. So anyway, Lenny oh. sent you a little message. Um, um, if I was extraterrestrial, um, I would be highly concerned about what's going on on this planet. And I would almost quarantine um, the ability for people on this planet to be going anywhere into space, you know, taking any of their stuff anywhere else until they could get a little bit more conscious um, about well, and, what they were doing. I mean, that's just my opinion, you know, like... Right, well, and you see, there are people who make millions of dollars on that every year, aren't there? Yeah. Um, ancient aliens, and uh, uh, who's the blue chicken guy, and who are the people who pick on the, the blue, blue chicken, chicken guy? The blue guy? <laughs> yeah. <we can. laughs> the blue Please avian the guy, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. You call him the blue chicken? <laughs> <laughs> the, bottom line, the bottom line is that, that, again, we live in a universe of infinite possibility. So it's all possible. Is it probable? I don't know. Carol Rosen is the one person who has absolutely convinced me that, that, she, that, that we as a species, that we as a people have been visited. She talked about her her personal experience with me. And if you can ever get her on to talk with her, do do, do that because um, she's a remarkable person. Uh, she's still over in Ashland, but she and her husband have moved to a different location. Um, the, the, so, so, yeah, somebody has communicated with us. Somebody has been with us. But, I'm uh, again, I'm not convinced it's... Um, 
flying saucers coming through space. I think that it's blinking into our reality construct and blinking back out somehow. And I, I have no idea how that works. That's Lenny's job to figure out. But the, 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 the bottom line is that, um, uh, again, with, with all of this technology, with, with all of this, if we have visitors, there might be visitors who are coming to help us. There might be visitors who aren't. Anybody who believes in a cosmic deus machina, well, good luck with that, I guess, is all I can say. I think that uh, we have to rely on our own resources and on our own ability. Now, I, I see we're coming up on the end of this. And, and if these people are right, and I hope they're wrong, you know, I, I hope that they're wrong, that, that we're going to go through another major cleansing. The other way it's called, I suppose, is a great dying. But, but if we're going to go through a, a great cleansing, each of us has already done what we're going to do, and each of us shares the responsibility for what has happened and what is happening. Anybody who says it's not my fault, man, well, I, I, I'm sorry. They've got another thing coming. Um, see what kind of clothes they're wearing. See, uh, see how they're getting around, um, so on and so forth. It's a situation where, again, we are going to face change. And change in the unknown always, always induces fear. And I'm no different than anybody else as far as that goes. My one, my one um, uh, experience with uh, something really, really weird that may have been something we created or may have been something that came here from somewhere else scared the ever loving pee waddle out of me. Now, you know me. I, I don't get frightened very easily, and I, I don't react negatively to fear very often. But in this particular case, I would not get out of my bed, okay? Uh, that's how scared I was at, at that particular point. Well, we all get scared at one point or another. You know, everybody has, everybody has their, their triggers for that. But as we go into this period of, of whatever it is, remember to practice love. We choose love. Remember to practice caring and concern for other people and recognize that they are going to be just as scared as you are. Recognize that just like the Green Rush here in Oregon, um, uh, there are going to be hucksters and, 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 and people who are going to prey on you. There are going to be people who say they have the illumination and have the answer. Well, if you have to pay 50 bucks for the answer, probably not the answer. Just get a guess. Um, but practice compassion with yourself and practice compassion with everybody else. Nobody gets out of this game alive that we know of. And if, if the Buddhists are right, we constantly, constantly recycle and we'll be back to try and sort things out and do things a little better the next time and an infinite number of times until everybody gets it right, and that's okay. Control your fear as much as you can. Live your life as well as you can. Practice love. Practice compassion. And, and that's really what I really, really, really want to get out today. Oh, yeah. Well, I, we appreciate that. So we're going to go off air in about two minutes. Okay. And there was a, a, a couple. Yeah, there was a couple things. So I've been talking to Paul Martin, a friend of mine. Uh, I'm Bridget Lynn Dogoff, your host. You're listening to Caring Stones and Digging Holes Radio Show on Revolution Radio, Studio A, uh, Wednesday, Wednesday edition. And um, give us, tell us again, there was a few things that you mentioned in the beginning. So there's Guy McPherson, right, dot com. Guy McPherson, which is uh, Nature Bats Last, I believe dot com. Yeah, website. Um, I would, I would, yeah, that's a website. 
um, I would strongly recommend Democracy Now. Uh, yeah, yeah, and their super good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That good. Love that. And uh, then there was a book. Jody. Oh yeah, oh, well, Jody. Yes, okay. Two books. Two books. Uh, one is Dark Money by Jane Meyer, and the other book is by Nancy McLean, and it's called Democracy in Chain. Yeah, yeah. And then a great. The great storyteller website is DodieCoyote.com, Thomas Doty. We yeah. grew up together. Uh, remarkable, great, great. remarkable. Great, great. Well, that'll give people lots of things to look at, um, your legacy from this show. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then I'll put in a shameless commercial plug. Um, we are going to be reopening Bud, Bud Junction in uh, Kirby. So, awesome. And, and you're going to be managing it? Yeah, that's the plan right now. Uh, I haven't pissed off the owner enough yet to not. Um, but the the bottom line, the bottom line is that hopefully we'll be adding a lot of CBDs and herbals. Maybe you and I can talk about that off there. Yeah, sometime. I would anyway, love. Thanks. Yeah, I'd love to talk to you thanks. about tinctures. But thank you so much for yep. coming on. Come on again soon, and uh, everybody, we'll see you Saturday. Have a great, have a great couple of days. Thank you. Revolution Radio, where you, the listeners, are in charge. Here at Revolution Radio, we present 48 broadcast hours of news and information each and every day. Revolution Radio never sleeps. Revolution Radio is worldwide and borderless information. Revolution Radio is also commercial free. Revolution Radio is supported 100% by you, the listeners. And that's why we appeal to you to donate and support this station and its expenses. You can support us in many available options like archive subscriptions, our seed pack selections, or even my woodworking store. And we also even have Revolution Radio's swag at the Revolution Radio Zazzle store, which you can get T-shirts, coffee cups, even a baby onesie. Or you can just plain donate to the cause we cannot continue without your support and your support is what helps pay the bills so please if you wish us to continue please stop by our station support page and drop a dime on us revolution radio where information never sleeps safe? Do you have the necessary information to assist you in confidently living through just about any survival situation? Is survival and gardening, off-grid living, medical knowledge, or even natural or man-made EMPs on your list of personal concerns? Do you have your documents and your personal information in a safe place in your hands where you know where it is? Well, check out our preloaded EMP-proof thumb drive. 
Over three gigs of survival documents and how-tos, plus the USDA offline food preservation website, and much, much more, including a surprise bonus we just can't tell you about here. With plenty of room left over to store your most important documents. Imagine if a megavirus or a computer failure took out your bank or all the... 